let's uh let's begin i want to thank everyone and welcome everyone for for joining the event is hosted by the aier's bastia society of san francisco the american institute for economic research was founded in 1933 and is the oldest nonpartisan economic research and advocacy organization with the global reach and influence aier is dedicated to developing and promoting the ideas of freedom and private governance to cultivate better, broader understanding of the fundamental principles that enable peace and prosperity around the world. The local chapter, the Bastia Society of San Francisco, is named after economist and statesman Friedrich Bastia, a social chapter that is dedicated to providing opportunity to entrepreneurs, academics, scholars, business owners, and members of the community to voice their ideas. Given the events which have transpired during the last three weeks in the South Caucasus and the constant call for peace by the international community, we, hold, we are holding a special event to bring awareness and clarity to the history of the region and advocating for peace. Just admitting people as, as I go. There are many layers to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict or more properly, the history of the right of self-determination and independence, where a nation is free from subjugation, institutional racism, and oppression, whose state of governance is in accordance with natural law and international law, whose people have a right to life, liberty, and property. One of the most prominent economists of the 20th century uh, and the bedrock of the Austrian School of Economics, Ludwig von Mises wrote in his book, Liberalism, because of the enormous powers that today stands at the command of the state, a national minority must expect the worst from the majority of a different nationality. As long as a state is granted the vast powers which it has today and with public opinion considers to be its right. The thought of having to live in a state whose government is in the hands of members of a foreign nationality is positively terrifying. It is frightful to live in a state in which at every turn one is exposed to persecution masquerading under the guise of justice by a ruling majority. It is dreadful to be handicapped even as a child in school on account of one's nationality and to be in the wrong before every judicial and administrative authority because one belongs to a national minority. End of quote. In addition, this is amplified in the state which lacks proper institutional frameworks, a sound philo philosophical foundation and a sound historical foundation. To better understand the context and the landscape of these ideas in which these current events in the past three weeks are taking place, we welcome Ruben Galician um, uh, to, to join us. Ruben Galician, in short, holds a first class honors degree in electrical engineering. He has worked and directed numerous engineering projects in the oil, gas, petrochemical industry throughout Europe and the Middle East. In addition to his extensive engineering background, uh, he has dedicated 40 plus years to the study of history and cartology, which I learned is about maps. Um, he was awarded honorary doctorate by the National Academy of Sciences in Armenia in 2008. Uh, when planning this event, I was speaking with Ruben and I asked him, how did you go about translating and bringing this information um, together? I was amazed to learn that Ruben speaks seven different languages. He speaks English, Farsi, Russian, German, French, Turkish and Armenian. Given his passion and extent in his extensive scope of all these languages, his books and contributions serve as a gateway for the English speaking world to knowledge, literature, 
writings, and history which would remain inaccessible to us. That being said, I would like to welcome Ruben Galician, to, who is joining us from Yerevan, Armenia. One moment as I unmute him. Ruben, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, well, these days, uh, most of uh, the foreign news in your country and Europe and the Middle East is uh, about our Armenia and the war between Artsakh, which is Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, Azerbaijan. And with the Turkish military help and the mercenaries, etc., etc. I'd like to say a few words about the countries involved, uh, mainly Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, I'll bring you to slideshow, which will give you history of Armenia, more or less. This is the oldest surviving world map, which uh, is a Babylonian clay tablet, about 600 BC, uh, which depicts the center of the world. On the right is the uh, translation of the cuneiform inscriptions. And in the center of the world, there are only three countries shown. Babylon, Assyria, and Armenia. Uh, some scholars say that the translation of the name Urartu to Armenia is incorrect, and these are, these are different countries. However, the next slides comes to prove the contrary. Next slide, sorry, it's gone too far off. The next slide is an inscription, a cuneiform inscription left by the Persian uh, King Dare, who uh, lived around the same period. And this inscription is written 517 before Christ BC. And it's in three languages. As there speaks about the Armenia, neighboring country, Armenia. In the three languages, in Old Persian, the name is Armenia. In the Elamite, it's Harminuya, and in Babylonian language, it says Urartu. Therefore, uh, I don't have any doubt that these three are one, this one and the same country in different languages, like Germany, Deutschland, etc. This is a map prepared for the uh, based on the works of Herodotus, the father of history, 450 BC. Here, Armenia and Persia are only countries that from the multitude of countries on the map still exists. The others uh, have disappeared, mainly leaving a few stone and uh, memorials from them. Now, uh, th this is the map of the area, slightly enlarged, which is the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. And you see the number of countries mentioned there, it's quite a lot. A number of countries. Again, from those countries, only Armenia, which here is in French Grand Armenie, and uh, maybe a part at the bottom part of the map, Persia, exists. Uh, the reason that underlining this is that above Armenia, north of it, there is a Caucasian Albania underlined in blue, and below Armenia, in uh, maroon, Media Atropaten, which is the Persian province of Azerbaijan with its old name. Its old name was Atropatan. Uh, here is a map of the second century. Again, by, by Ptolemy, the founder of geography, more or less. Uh, here, underlined red, you see two Armenia Mayor and Armenia Menor. Lesser Armenia and Greater Armenia, both between the Black Sea and the Caspian, slightly to their south. To the west of the Caspian, there is a cold underlined blue Albania, which is again Caucasian Albania, which became a Christian country later. I'll come to that later. Uh, there's, I'm showing a few sample maps of 12th century, this one French map, which shows the world divided into three continents. At the top, southern, east is Asia, 
below left Europe on the right Africa. And in Asia, you see two Armenians are on the line red, which is the Armenia proper. And the one in two sections is of Cilician Armenia, which was next to the Mediterranean. Albania again shown in the north of Armenia, underlined blue. Now we jump a few 300 years to 1595. Uh, Dutch cartographer Mortelius drew the map of the world and in a large section shows the second part of Armenia. And again, in that part, there's Armenia and Syria, Egypt and Persia shown, no other countries. It shows the importance of the Armenians at the time. And the thing is that at those times, although Armenia as its independent country did not exist, it was part of, at times, part of the um, Byzantine Empire, Persian Empire, and they later Ottoman Empire. However, since Armenians lived there, that region was called Armenia on all maps until 1923, when the region was cleansed, so to speak, of Armenians. And this is a map of 1877, an Anatolian map, an Ottoman Turkish map, which shows the name, no, name of the Ottoman Empire, Anatolia as only the peninsula of Asia Minor, Armenia to its east, um, written in, in translated the, the Aaron, Ottoman script into uh, Latin, and then south of it, Kurdistan. And in the region that is mentioned, Shirvan on the right, this is the region that today Azerbaijan exists, next to Georgia, and below, south of it, is Iran. Now we jump here to 1730. Here, it's an interesting map. In the earlier stages of history, According to Strabo, the region of Albania was occupied by 26 Albanian tribes, most of whom spoke different languages. And later these people became Christians in, during the second half of the fifth century. And in seventh, seventh and ninth centuries, many of them converted to Islam. From the Middle Ages, the region was ruled by Persian and Turkish Khans who ruled the land that was generally known as Shivan, here underlined green. Even then, the Armenian Meliks, the landowners of mountainous Karabakh, which was in that area, stayed partially independent and paid their taxes to the, the Khans, whoever they were. During this time, the country named Azerbaijan existed, not, did not exist north of the Arax River, but south of it, underlined blue, there is a Persian province of Azerbaijan, which is always has been south of the region. Now, it continued, the Armenian division between different countries continued until the 1918, when after the World War it finishes and the Russia withdrew from the war and the three republics were established in the South Caucasus. This is uh, those, uh, the, the, the Armenia and the other country, Georgia, came, adopted their own historic names. But the third country, where Tatars and Turks live in the region of east of Armenia, and so it was, was decided to be called the Republic of South Caucasus. But, uh, but according to decisions of the uh, local uh, 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 politicians and instigation of Ataturk, it was called uh, Azerbaijan, borrowing its name from the north southern neighbor Iranian province of Azerbaijan. Um, when, when in 1918 this the region became independent, Armenia has this. Uh, uh, area shown on this map. Then in 1920, the communists went off occupied the three countries. Lenin intended to encourage the newly emerged Turkish nationalist, Ataturk, 
to join the communist camp. And to this end, he donated the, the, donated the region of Kars, Ani, and the old capital, of, old capital of Armenia, and Mount Ararat to Turkey. And Stalin, in 1921, decided to give the blue line regions to Azerbaijan. Although the previous years, 1920, both Azerbaijan and Armenia had agreed that these areas should belong to Armenia because they were mainly populated by Armenians. However, this was not to be, and Stalin's ruling stayed on. And here is the shape of the republics that existed from 1921 onwards until in the independence of the newly developed, the newly independent countries in 1990s. This situation was in 1921, and I want to present some facts about the neighboring Azerbaijan since that time. Azerbaijan was a newly country, a new country established in 1918. But the com communist rulers in Moscow insisted that each of these rep their rep uh, republics should have their own particular history and culture. And to achieve to this goal, a newly born country could only take ownership of the historical events of the region and appropriate the existing cultural monuments or get rid of them. Here was a newly established country, Azerbaijan, which borrowed still with a borrowed name, no dedicated culture and history, and this had to be put right by taking the proper action. Let us look at its origins. To define the color of their flags, the Azerbaijanis say that the blue color indicates their Turkic origin, while the green relates to their religion, Islam and the red signifies democracy and modernity. However, to claim indigenous ancestry, say that they are descendants of the Christian Albanians, but that they, for this, they need to, need to have this, this ancestry to own the local monuments that existed there. However, this may create a problem with Turkey. Therefore, when solidarity with Turkey is needed, they switch back to their claim of Turkish ancestry according to the flag, even claiming that Azerbaijan and Turks are one people split into two different countries by the Persian and Russian overlords. The controversy still continues between the uh, Azerbaijani historians and scholars. Let me stop the Until 1936, when this the country was called Azerbaijan, the people themselves called them themselves Tatars, Turks, or simply Muslims. In 1936, the Soviet of the uh, Moscow, the Soviet Union in Moscow, decided during their uh, plenum, they decided to name the people of Azerbaijan should call themselves Azeris. And from then on, there was a decree was issued that nobody should be Turk, each, everybody should be called Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani. That is 1936. In other words, uh, you went to bed as a Turk and when in the morning we woke up as Azerbaijan. This is the basis of their nationality because Azerbaijanis are those people living south of the border who are a Persian Indo-European race, not a Turk race. Now, Azerbaijan claims to have 3,000 years of uh, history. Uh, Ruben, uh, the, once, uh, I, I could hear your paper shuffling in the microphone. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, the, the, uh, uh, the Azeris claim to have 3,000 3, years old of history boasting to be all Albanians as their ancestors, but when, as, as I said, politically necessary, they changed their claim to Central Asian Turkish stock who arrived in the area during the 11th century. Somehow this supposedly 3000 year old country has no written language and their language is, was written 
And it was spoken that the official language was Persian until 1850s, and their script was Persian. And uh, subsequent to the independence, they've changed their script three times. First to Latin, then to Cyrillic, then again to another sort of Latin. So no generation can read the old history. The alphabet is changed and nobody can read the old one. Uh, you who are listening to this presentation uh, may come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries. Uh, but uh, you are proud to have an American culture because the American culture is the amalgamation of the good points of good parts of those cultures. And everybody probably says, I'm, Amer I'm American, and we understand that the culture is a heritage of those countries. However, when we come to Azerbaijan, Mr. Aliyev uh, has decided to call them Azeris. The country, as Strabo said, consisted of 2,026 tribes. And to these tribes now have added Kurds, Turks, uh, Talishis, Lesgins, Sahurs, Avars, Udis, etc. And instead of being proud of having an amalgamation of all those cultures, Aliyev imitating Atatürk claims that all these people are Azeris and the languages spoken is Azeri because indigenous people's languages are forbidden. They cannot use their own language. Now, in, uh, in this, uh, 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 36, as I said, when the country became Azerbaijan, the old Khanets, uh, the Central, uh, uh, Central uh, Asian countries uh, suffered the same uh, fate. Let me get, get back to the presentation and show the map. Azerbaijan was born there, as I mentioned, and also in the Central Asia, these variously colored countries emerged. These countries did not exist until 1923 20, 20, to 36. They were, uh, these areas were ruled by various uh, Khanates and Emirates, Khans and Emirs, who were under Russian control. And the sense, the certain uh, civilized, sense civilization centers such as Bukhara, Samarwan, Mevr, etc. existed, which was part of the Persian civilization and everything was Persian in this species. So these countries began to form in from 1923 to 1936. The big country, Kazakhstan, that you see, see here, was originally called Kyrgyzstan. The Kyrgyzstan was the Southern Kyrgyzstan. They then decided to give a new name to Kazakhstan because there was a large tribe of Kazakhs living there, etc. However, this is meant that, uh, outside the complete scope of it, but it's, uh, it comes to show that uh, these newborn countries have the same problem as Azerbaijan has. The, the dream of the pan-Turkism, which is for the Turkish peoples, uh, the gray wolves movement, etc., to connect, uh, to have a belt of Turkic speaking languages, uh, countries, uh, here shown in yellow, Violet, green, and dark and light and light green. These are all Turkic speaking countries to the border, up to the border of China. There's a one red country, Armenia, that blocks them from being a belt. This is the reason that the Turks wanted to eliminate this and have this belt completed so that they have one belt of Turkic speaking countries. From 1921 to 1990, where Armenians live, were living in Karabakh, they were repressed by the central Azeri government through closing of Armenian university, university closing Armenian radio programs, uh, and uh, delaying and even 
preventing economic growth and economic help from the central government. And during the Second World War, only one out of 19 Azerbaijanis were sent to the front, while from the Armenian population, one out of three was sent to the front. This sort of a cleansing was practiced in order to reduce the Armenian population of Karabakh and Nakhijewan, and they partially managed it to, because Karabakh before that had about 200,000 population. Within about this period of 30, 40, 50 years, it was reduced to 120, 130,000. Now, there's a, I want to talk about the present dilemma, dilemma. Where do we stand? What is happening? During the last months of the USSR, Armenians of Karabakh, fully in compliance with the ruling regulations, organized a referendum and declared independence as per the United Nations Charter's principles of self-determination. However, subsequently and subsequently, the Azeri army started shelling of the capital, Stepanakert, and the 1991-94 war began, eventually culminating in the victory of Artsakh against the Azeri government forces, who, as well as liberating most of Artsakh, occupied a security belt of buffer zone around them in order to prevent the possible Azeri shooting or shelling of Artsakh border towns and villages. Eventually, the Russians arranged a ceasefire and the OSCE group was set up to begin negotiations for peace. During the 25 years of negotiations to find peaceful solutions, the Aliyev regime always insisted that as a precondition, all the lands, including Karabakh, which is the Armenians called Artsakh, should be returned to their original owners, the Azeris, which is doubted because Armenians lived there for 3,000 years, over at least over 2,000 years. And the Azeri as a country, Azerbaijan, was established in 1918 only. How could 2,000 years ago people occupy a land of a country that was born in 1918? That's a question to be answered. Now, this is the situation of Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan next to each other with the red blob in Azerbaijan being Nagorno-Karabakh, which whose people suffered this fate. And as for the next 20 years, 1990, after 1995, Turkey, uh, sorry, Azerbaijanis did not see any, see any progress of their own demands, any acceptance of their demands. In, 19, in, in 2016, they attacked Artsakh, and after four days of battles, were again unable to gain much control. And a ceasefire was arranged by the Russians, as had been arranged in 1994. But it didn't last long also, and last June, Azerbaijani forces again attacked Armenia and again will prove repulse. Now, here comes the big brother, Turkey, who seems to have assured Azerbaijanis that they will arrange to a blitzkrieg and occupy Artsakh within two to three days. In July, under the pretext of joint military maneuvers, they brought heavy artillery, tanks, military experts, as well as six F-16 NATO fighter jets and their pilots to Baku, who stayed on there and were deployed in the surprise attack of September 27 on Artsakh. Turkey also hired thousands of Syrian and ISIL mercenaries and sent them to Azerbaijan, some of whom were dressed in Azeri border guards to fight against Armenians or Artsakh. The blitzkrieg did not work, and according to their previous practices, instead of Azeris and Turkish military, and instead, the Azeri and Turkish military artillery and drones began bombing civilian and civil infrastructures, 
with Israeli and Turkish rockets and cluster bombs, causing much destruction and damage. One NATO Turkish F-16 even shot down an Armenian jet, which was at the time flying 60 kilometers inside the Armenian airspace. On October 10th, Russia arranged for a ceasefire for humanitarian purposes to collect the bodies of exchange prisoners. But five minutes after the implementation, Azeris attacked the town of Hadrut. And since then, they have been, have not stopped their all out attack on bombardments of civilian targets as well as the military front. They even intentionally aim at the internal, at foreign reporters, from which two French, one, uh, one Russian, and one BBC reporter were injured. Fortunately, not fatally. As an afterthought, I think Azerbaijan doesn't want a ceasefire, because if they want to collect the bodies, they have a, they have a problem. So far, Armenia has announced that they, we have lost about 500 soldiers in the front, about 100 and odd civilians to the bombardments. The Azerbaijanis say that the military losses are uh, war secrets. They have not exposed it. However, counted from the Armenian side, it seems that the, their losses are over 5,000 including mercenaries. And if Azerbaijanis take those 5,000 corpses back home, what's going to happen with the civilian population? What would they say? How many of our children have been lost? Uh, already in Baku, there are movements of people not letting their children to the front because they say it's not our war. We have nothing against Armenians. How we give it? Again, during the negotiations, during these negotiations, they are, they claim, still claim stands, they saying that Armenians have occupied our ancestral land. And Karabakh is Azerbaijani ancestral land. Armenians have not forgotten Sumgait, the pogroms of Sumgait, and the struck city near Baku, where Armenian civilians and were killed by Azeri mobs in their homes and no one was punished, as well as the beheadings of the Armenian officers, etc. cetera. I'm sorry, uh, this is the map of the present day Armenia, Artsakh, et cetera, which as it stands, and these are the re re regions that are attacked by Azerbaijan to the Eastern part and the North of Karabakh, North of and the South of uh, I'm sorry to say, show these pictures, which are not pleasant. Um, these are bombings of Stepanakert civilian areas. And there on the top left, you see the ch church being, uh, which had been bombed. And Belgian Armenian cellist came and played a solar recital there. Here on the right, you can see part of an unexploded bomb uh, rocket. And the others are the capital of our Karabakh, parts of capital of uh, Stepanakert, the capital of uh, Artsakh. Uh, you see, the civilian destruction is immense. Uh, when I was talking about uh, Sumgait, I will show you a couple of images of Sumgait. What happens? What happened in Sumgait? Sorry, wrong way. This is aftermath of the Sumgait pogroms, where population of Armenia overnight were this was attacked by a Azeri mob, and no one was punished. And uh, we'll come to this later. Azeris want the land, want as they say they want the Arabas area but they don't want the people. They only want the land without Armenians. They have said so many times. The thing is that if Azeris take Barabakh, 
in no time, the allied forces will effectively empty Karabakh of Armenians, who either will be killed or deported overnight, like the Armenians of Baku were deported over in one giving them till one day to depart in 1989. About over 200,000 residents of Baku were Armenian were deported overnight. Now, uh, in 2000, and we, we, Armenians have not forgotten that in 2002, 2004, and uh, during a military conference in Budapest, in the dormitory, an Azeri officer named Ranil Safarov beheaded the sleeping Armenian officer, Gulian Markarian, with an ax. After serving a few years sentence in Budapest, it was agreed between Azerbaijan in Hungary and Azerbaijan that Safarov should be sent home to serve the sentence there. And upon his arrival in Baku, he was given a hero's welcome. He was, rank, he was promoted in rank, given a flat and a car because he had beheaded an Armenian in his sleep. In 2016, after the partial occupation of one of the villages in the four day war of 2016, in the village of Talish, Azeri soldiers, of which Azeri soldiers occupied for a few hours. And this, this was the situation of the, sorry, <laughs> on the outskirts of the town, they killed this elderly people who were over 80s, cut their ears and took them as trophy back home. This is the signature of the Azeri soldiers. It is that they've been taught that Armenians are killers. They should be destroyed the way, any way you wish. Now, in, uh, on October 11th, a few days ago, the Azeri forces penetrated an Armenian village called Hadrut, which is on the border of the Armenia and Azerbaijan, and came into the first house. There was an old elderly lady and had a disabled son, cut the heads of both of them. For no reason, just for fun. These actions make the genocide intention of the Azeris and mercenary forces very, very clear for us, which is completion of the Turkish genocide perpetrated by the Turks in 1915-23. It is clear that the Azeris are fighting for extra land to be secured without Armenians, while the Armenians are fighting for their homeland and life. Uh, I'm uh, sorry to say that uh, only yesterday, your Secretary of State, equating Armenia and Azerbaijan, said both should have to should stop stop fighting. Well, Armenia had stopped fighting after the ceasefire. The Azerbaijan is continuing. It is difficult to see equate those two countries, those two peoples, being with the, talk to them with the same language. Uh, and in my personal opinion. Uh, the involvement of Turkey, supply of the most modern drones and the use of cluster bombs, and also use of the NATO's F-16s would not have happened without the targeted approval of President Trump. Now, let us go here toward the end of the Turkish dream, Turkish dream. Turks have established a foothold in Azerbaijan and they're not going to let it go easily. It, Aliyev is in their hands. If you ask uh, Aliyev uh, a question, he will not answer to you directly. He has to consult his Turkish consultants and all the answer, answer later. They are, not to go, they are not going away. And the overall goal is to take over the Azeri economy, oil and gas pipelines, and then if he does that, Europe 
can be his slave. He can dictate his terms to European countries and everything will be according to the Ottoman Empire's rules. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ruben, for taking the time of, for putting this presentation together. Um, we covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time. And before we move on to questions, next uh, 10 minutes or so, it, 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 is, it is open. I'll give it about a minute. Tell you the truth, today was a very, very difficult day for me because um, in, in spite of the assurances of Russians and the French, etc., uh, today was one of the strongest Turkish attacks on Armenia. They destroyed one, uh, hospital, one civilian hospital and uh, they, they have, the, the heavy fighting still continues, bombardment through rockets, etc., still continues. However, I'm at disposal at your disposal for questions. Okay, I'm receiving a I'm receiving a question, um, but from from Sona, uh, will the presentation and the recordings of the session be made available? I don't need the mic unmuted, but maybe if you could answer that. Uh, yes, well, we Sona, we will work on making this available a recording of this available. Uh, let me get back to you on that. We have um, we, we have uh, a question from Yulia Kev. Um, would it be possible to point to and or share the resources and the documents about the Baku Sungai programs? Oh, well, there are books on it. Not many, but there are a few books on, on the Sumgait uh, tragedy. There's a uh, Sum, the Sumgait pogroms, and they're in English. There's two volumes. I think I saw one on Amazon even today. If you ask for Sumgait, there's a detailed record account of the, what happens in Sumgait. And the, the, the thing is that it happened before Armenia or Azerbaijan. Had in had were independent. It was in Soviet days, and the Soviet state was, was supposed to pro protect its citizens. Uh, after the killings, which uh, where about thirty odd Armenians were slaughtered and their heads were cut off, uh, there was a uh, number of people were arrested, sent to Moscow, and in no time everybody was released, because uh, Mr. Aliyev's father well, had a big position in. Uh, the central government in the Soviet Union, he arranged for this, for the thing to be swept under the carpet. Well, for Baku, I don't know if there are any reports, but uh, the fact is that, you know, you, in Baku, there were over 200,000 Armenians. Now, if you have an, a name ending with IAN, you will not be let into this uh, Azeri border. Even you will not be able to pass in transit through Azeri, the, uh, Air, Baku airport. They will deport you back to where you, where you came from. Uh, so they are not a, not a single Armenian living there unless they are married to Azeri Muslims and they have changed their surname. Okay. So that's the result of if it's not a, the result of deportation and what is. Uh, uh, this is a question from Sophia um, Ruben. Uh, where do you see this all going? Uh, we have lost more than 500 people on the ground thus far. Well, uh, <clears throat> we have a military ally, Russia, who hasn't moved a finger so far. Because he says that the, my, <clears throat> my agreement with Armenia is if anybody attacks Armenia, we will help Armenia. However, there are a number of times that Azeri forces have attacked Armenia. Nothing has happened. And uh, I'm quite surprised because Russia has got a lot, a lot to lose. Because once Turkey is in Azerbaijan, those mercenaries are going to move up north 
to Russia and south to Iran. And both these countries will be little losers. I'm surprised that the actions are non-actions of Russia, our ally. And I cannot say any more because if I continue, <laughs> I don't know what I'll say. Um, we, are, we are pressed for time. We have, we have questions just pouring in just one sec. Um, what do you think uh, Pashinyan's position is and, and why isn't he really asking for, for help from other leaders? Uh, other leaders who? Nobody will help uh, Armenia because our ally is Russia and our other countries are far away from us. Who's going to help? Mr. Trump even hasn't said one word about this. It's 18 days, 70, 18 days, and uh, who do we rely on? Mr. Trump? Uh, or uh, England, who has, hasn't even acknowledged anything yet, and uh, Mr. Boris Johnson, who was of the same material as Mr. Trump, I think. And the uh, rest of the Europe, uh, they are in disarray, even in the Mediterranean. They cannot stop the Turks from sending their war warship into the Mediterranean, their research ships into Greek waters. Uh, why don't they stop, send, send some, say, do something against Turkey? Why is the Turkey a NATO member still? These are questions to be asked to other leaders of the other countries. I cannot answer these questions. We are waiting for this, our ally to act. If the ally does not act, then the road is open to ask anybody else that we think fit. Uh, Fashinian doesn't, hasn't asked the uh, Russians to enter because once the Russians enter Karabakh, and Karabakh will not be Armenian, will become perhaps Russian province um what this is one last question um because we are pressed on time hasmik asks uh what can diaspora armenians do in addition to what we all are individually doing to promote our cause uh diaspora armenians uh, well i when i was living in london i now live in in uh, Armenia. Uh, what we did in this sort of a situation, we sent equipment, light, light equipment, and uh, particularly funds. Nowadays, you, you can buy anything in Armenia, uh, so equipment is not needed. Uh, if, if you want to help, if anybody wants to help, any donations to uh, Armenian fund will be helpful. We ourselves here are organizing donations to this fund because they, they are the people who know where and what to buy and where to spend the money. Otherwise, lots of people have sending for food stuff or medicines, etc., which are not actually needed, and those that are needed are not there. Well, um, I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Galichin on, on joining us at the AIR's Boston outside of San Francisco for dedicating his time um, and all, all the work he's, he's done. You could, you could find and purchase his books on Amazon. Uh, they, are, they are, this is one of them. Um, excellent, excellent book summarizes, great summary within two to three hours. You can get, uh, it's the length of a nice movie. Uh, you can read a wonderful book and get a condensed version of the history I want to conclude by, by simply saying that this is, in addition to Armenia, it's a humanitarian um, event that, that truly affects Western values. You have two countries here, Armenia, who has been aspiring, and Artsakh, who has been aspiring to Western values of life, liberty, property, and democracy uh, found in the Enlightenment and seen in the writings of Bastiat and Mises and all the greats that have made Western civilization what it is. And this, this, this attack on these people who are striving for self-recognition and, and independence is um, an insult to these values. And I would just want to conclude on that remark that although we are distant geographically in value, we are connected. 
Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. A big thank you to uh, Dr. Galician uh, for making time, his time, and, and presenting this information, all the research and contributions that he has done. Um, again, please check out his books. You could also visit his, um, I, will, I, I see a link uh, requesting me to send, uh, I, I see a request, I see a request asking me to send the link of the book. I will do that. Um, well, the, my, my, most of my books are available online. If you go to my site, website, www.rubengalician.com, uh, books are available for free download. Image quality is not good, very good, but uh, the book, books are there. All my books are there. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me, and I hope I've given you some enlightenment on the situation today. Thanks. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.